Welcome to another episode of A Minute Till Six. I'm your host, Mark Haynes, also known as MH the Champ, along with my co host, Chris Perry. You can find me at Chris.Perry SR. And today, we got a very special person on the, in the building. Well, not in the building, but on this on this interview. Um, he's a Florida legend, uh, Heisman Trophy winner, first round draft pick. If you don't know yet, it's Mr. Charlie Ward, man. Thank you for coming on and uh, jumping on this uh, interview with us, Charlie. Hey, I appreciate you guys uh, very much giving the opportunity to uh, – we on a minute till six. What is that? How did yeah. y'all come up with that name? Yes, yeah, sir. I, I I let I let Chris Perry go with that one. A uh, minute till six. That's a it's a subtle nod to the city from which we come, which is Fresno, California. Five five nine is the area code. Five five nine. One minute till six. Yeah, we 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 originally started dropping every episode at five fifty nine. So that's how uh, that's okay. how that came about. <laughs> And if and if I didn't clarify earlier, I said first round draft pick. I mean first round NBA draft pick. You're one of the we go, we we might as well start there. You're one of the few um, uh, athletes. I can't even say player because two sport athletes in college at the university at Flor- Florida State. Florida State. Let me, let me, yeah, let yeah. me get it right. <laughs> let me get it right. <laughs> he fixed that real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Florida State Seminoles playing basketball four years and uh football at the same time um how was 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 florida state one of the only colleges that were going that was going to allow you to uh play both sports is that part of the reason why you picked them um well they're the only only school or only coach bowden was the only coach uh that was recruiting me that had allowed guys to play uh basketball and football um, and so that was a uh, um, significant uh, decision, you know, uh, to a uh, factor in my decision to, um, to, to attend Florida State because of that uh, situation. You know, Brad Johnson um, played football, he's a quarterback, and he played basketball for years. Uh, he discontinued playing basketball to focus on football. Uh, but I knew if he was going to allow Brad to play basketball, that he would allow me to play. And he kept his word. Um, he's a Christian coach. Uh, and so he was fair and honest uh, with me during the uh, recruit process. And, of course, during that time, you just have to trust that they're going to do what they, they say in recruiting because, as you know, in recruiting, sometimes they tell you what they want want you to hear. And then once you get to campus – you know, you have to make a decision on, you know, whether they're going to let you play or not. But, you know, I was grateful that he kept his word and I was able to play both sports. Definitely, definitely. And um, also what a lot of people don't know about you, um, which when, when I was doing my research and, you know, prepping for this and stuff, I found out that not only were you a, a dual sport uh, player, you were – well, technically, I, I I seen quadruple, but you were drafted in three different sports, which was uh, you got drafted twice in baseball. And um, what was your, uh, you know, was was baseball just kind of, you know, I, I played baseball as well at, you know, c- coming up up until high school, and then I then I stopped. And for me, baseball was just, it wasn't, the, it, you didn't get that same feel for as, as basketball and football or whatever. It's, it's kind of hard, I'd say, to be passionate about that. Um, what was your reason for, you know, passing up on them them uh, two times that you got drafted in baseball? Um, well, you know, I, or not, I came up you know, playing all sports in, ele- you know, elementary all the way up through high school. Um, and I only played, I played baseball like fifth, fifth and sixth grade or middle school years um, in the YMCA, a Y League. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was fun, you know, to do. And then I only played baseball one year in high school. Um, and so and that was because of injury, due to injury, uh, my freshman and sophomore year. But 
you know, baseball was something I didn't even play in college and then, you know, ended up getting drafted, you know, twice my junior and senior year. Um, and so it was really never a, a major option. Um, it was just an option just in case um, something else didn't pan through or come through. Um, so I really, it wasn't really something I thought about, you know, doing because I was one year, I was like 59th round and then next year I was like 19th round. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it wasn't like Kyler Murray, you know, where he's a first round pick where he had to make a choice on whether he was going to play baseball or football or basketball, whatever the case may be. But that wasn't my situation. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so, I mean, it's well documented that it definitely was a, a great decision to pass on those two baseball uh, drafts because uh, you went on to win the Heisman Trophy at uh, Florida State. Um, but you became one of, I think it's only 16 Heisman Trophy winners that didn't go pro to the NFL. Um, was that something which you have chosen football if they were drafted higher or drafted at all, excuse me, would you have chosen football over basketball? Um, well, my whole thing I deal with, with NFL was um, I chose to complete my senior year of basketball, uh, which meant that I was going to miss uh, the combine, uh, which, of course, that just says that you're not interested. But um, you know, I went through the, whole, the other process um, with, uh, with the NFL and did draft day, I mean, um, pro day on campus. Um, had some conversations with some clubs, some uh, folk, some teams. The next day, uh, did personal workouts for a few teams that were interested. And, you know, I, that was the extent of the process uh, for the NFL. And so, you know, but during that, that time, I was putting a lot of time into perfecting my skills as a basketball player, because that's where I was behind the most. Um, and so I put a lot of time and effort into that. Pro day went, went on okay. You know, I didn't do anything uh, spectacular, but, you know, I had a lot of film uh, out there. And, you know, I wasn't, I really didn't prepare uh, like I should have for the, for the pro day. Um, I did go out and throw on occasions, um, but I really didn't prepare uh, for it. Um, but I knew going in that, you know, they told me I was going to be a third or fourth round draft pick. Uh, I don't know um, if I could have improved my stock uh, at any time. But during that time, I knew that being a first round pick as a black quarterback and my height um, right. wasn't wasn't something that was going to, you know, be – it wasn't prevalent during that time. And, you know, and so the, the black part may, may have been not an issue, but the height and all the other uh, things that they said I didn't have uh, probably was a, was a factor, especially in the first round, uh, which, you know, if I would gotten drafted in the first round in the NFL draft, I would have played football. Because that's, you know, that's one of the places where, you know, you don't get an opportunity and you're going to get a legit opportunity if you're a first round pick. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I didn't get drafted at all. There were some teams that were interested um, in drafting me, uh, Minnesota being one in the first round, but they weren't sure that I was 100% committed, which I'm not, um, to the NFL. And so they didn't, you know, they didn't want to pull the trigger and me not, not come and play. I had made a statement that, you know, if I, was, if I wasn't drafted in the first round, that I would consider my other options, mm -hmm. um, which meant that in the first round, I was going to play football. But I didn't do it. They, they weren't so old that I was 100% committed to football, uh, which at that time I was not. Um, but, of course, if I'd have gotten drafted in the first round, I would have played. Got you. And, and Charlie, you – so 
the and the NBA has you listed at a uh, six two. Are you are you not actually six two? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm six two and, and I'm six two and cleats, which you know we we all play we all play in cleats when you play football. Right. So, um, yeah. I'm six two in cleats. Uh, probably six one in tennis shoes, um, depending upon the orthotics. But you know, nonetheless, I'm 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 six foot five eleven and a quarter, six foot. Six one, six two. So, depending upon somewhere, somewhere in there. Yeah, all of that, all of that, all of that. Yeah, all, all of the above. All right. So, so you you make the decision. You make the decision. Uh, well, they they kind of you know made the decision for you in, in a in a way. Um, and you're you're in your rookie season, and and in the NBA, you're in your rookie season. Uh, I heard I've, I've read some things. I uh, wanted to see if you could say if it's true or not uh, that you got an offer during your rookie, your NBA rookie season, that from the Kansas City Chiefs to be the backup for Joe Montana. Well, actually, that was um, during the NFL draft. Um, so uh, at the time I was coming out, they had it was maybe four or five day draft. Um, and the fifth round was on Monday. Um, and so um, Kansas City called me to ask if I would be willing to um, consider uh, being the backup to uh, Joe Montana. And, of course, that was a great offer because Joe Montana was my, one of my heroes. Um, and we were very similar in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, um, I just told them that, you know, I, they drafted me, you know, I appreciate it, but I wouldn't be 100%. I couldn't let them know 100% that I would, you know, choose, uh, football because, you know, I was going, had an opportunity to be drafted in the NBA. At the time, I had no clue that I'd be a first-round pick <clears throat> in basketball uh, in the NBA. And so it was really a faith walk. And, you know, God you know, ordained my steps because he allowed me to go and pursue um, basketball after the draft at a really, really fast pace. And so I put a lot of time and effort into uh, preparing for those NBA combines, um, and, you know, he opened the door uh, through relationships and through work ethic and through upside, you know, and I was able to uh, be drafted uh, by the New York Knicks, 26 pick. Yeah, 26 pick, 26 pick. And before we go, we go definitely go and get some questions out of you from, from your New York Knicks days. Uh, but I um, wanted to ask you about uh, winning a national championship because – you basically you've done everything in college football that you could possibly do as a quarterback, uh, from the Davy O'Brien uh, to you know Heisman, and also uh, the first uh, national championship in school history, right? Yes, sir. Um, what what can you remember about that moment and uh, you know actually uh, winning that game against Nebraska, right? Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, it was a um, it was a game that we knew was going to be a tough one. Because the year before, we played them in the Orange Bowl, uh, and we beat them 27-14. And the next season, uh, people expected that to happen again because we had a great year. Um, lost one game to Notre Dame. And um, going to that, that game, people are expecting us to win the game easily like we did um, the year before. But we knew it was a championship game. Uh, I'm not sure if they had lost. I think they may have been undefeated. Um, at the time, and, and so, you know, it was one of those uh, games that we we knew what we had. Um, we knew what they were going to bring, um, and uh, it was it became a defensive battle. Um, they challenged us from an offensive standpoint. You know, our, our receivers, they challenged them. Um, our offensive line, they did some different things as far as stunts and uh, a lot of different things, and so, we had to try to figure it out. 
Um, but we we had prepared ourselves for you know everything. Uh, we were a veteran group, um, and we didn't play our best. Um, and of course, they they had something to do with that. Um, but we made the necessary plays on offense to to be able to give us opportunities. You know, to either kick field goals. I think we may have scored one touchdown the whole game. Um, and but we were able to drive the football up and down the field, just weren't able to score. But the key was, was our defense. Um, our defense came into the year, um, people were underestimating them um, because we had lost some, some, some very good football players and the offense kind of overshadowed them from a, uh, from a from media standpoint. Um, but we had some really, really good football players on our defense. And that was really the key because they held Tommy Frazier and their offense down um, the, pretty much the whole game. Um, I think they may have scored two touchdowns or you know, one or two touchdowns um, during the game. But they during the, during the rest of the time, you know, it was really shut down. And, and so we were able to um, overcome – you know, bad offense, but with good defense, and we had some timely offense uh, to be able to help us in that game. But the thing that I remember the most is the last drive. Uh, the last drive was an opportunity for us to kind of cement um, or close the game. Um, and as a competitor, quarterback, um, and definitely offense, we, we were very competitive. Uh, we want to go out and, and close the game. And we were uh, blessed to be able to do that. We made some plays when we need to make some plays. We got a couple, you know, a couple penalties to help us along on that drive. And you know, when it's all said and done, that's those are the things that you you're gonna be remembered by. You know, what did you do uh, when the game was on the line? And you know, that's Michael Jordan, that's LeBron. You know, people always you know talk about LeBron failing in the NBA finals because he lost so many games and I mean the guy was there um, but he you know he's won some as well but yeah, that was an opportunity for us to win the game and we did yes sir yes sir yeah. uh, I want to get to the Knicks now you draft hold on hold on, hold on Chris let me one, one more question before before we go there um, I, was, I was watching uh you and Anquan Bolden's uh, live interview yesterday. And, okay. I, yeah, I seen that you mentioned um, about, you know, co uh, college athletes uh, getting paid for their name and likeliness and all that. Mm -hmm. um, being All right, we lost the sound for a I, second. I can hear you. I can hear you. I think he was uh, going towards college athletes being paid. Yeah, there you go. All right, yeah, for the name and likeness. So, and um, now the NBA G League has this this uh, new thing they're trying out with with uh, top NBA players. One is Jalen Green. Um, he's from our hometown, Fresno, California. Um, I know you, you you're you're passionate and you know about you know, making sure college kids get the right transition over to the pros and just want to get your opinion on the thing with the G League and what they're doing with Jalen Green and a couple of other guys. Um, well, I think the NCAA is working to try to, uh, I'm going to say compete, but to be able to assist those athletes if that's what they want to choose. And, you know, as you have heard, I'm a guy that, you know, I want – want to be able to have options. And that's one of the things I teach uh, the kids that I play, I coach. Um, and whenever I go ahead and talk, you know, to kids, I'm like, you know, you have options. And so that's the reason why I'm not a big proponent for, you know, one sport until a certain time, because if that's what you want to focus on when you're a junior or senior to prepare for or try to get a scholarship in that sport, then that's fine. But even still with that, you should play – uh, another sport that may be complementary to your sport. Um, and so I'm for options. So if the G League is an option for a top-ranked high school player, 
go for it. You know, um, we've seen, you know, um, LeVar Bell's uh, boys, you know, take that route. I think his, his last name is Hampton. Um, they've mm-hmm. taken that route, you know, going to, you know, Europe. Um, and I, if that's what you want to do and you're prepared for it and that's an option for you, I'm all for it. Um, and and in, in college, my, um, I'm all for guys being able to use their name and likeness um, to be able to do camps, um, be a sponsor for uh, a car dealer. Car dealer. Um, I just think there has to be some education on all those aspects because the thing that you know keeps throwing keeps getting thrown out is he has a he's signing a five hundred thousand dollar contract. I think that's what people keep saying. Um, and as we know, if you're living in California, five hundred thousand is not five hundred thousand. Right. And that's just you know, yeah. I mean, that's just reality. And and then people will say, well. You know, 250000 is great for a high school kid. Yes, I'm, that is awesome as well, and I'm all for it. But how do we use that 250000 Because you want to live, you want to splurge a little bit, and then people are going to be in your pocket. you got to pay your team um, out of some of that money. And so, you know, when you start looking at it, if you're not educated, someone can easily take you for what you thought you may have had because you're not educated, you may have the wrong people around you. And so, and that happens even with a person who's going to school for four years. And so that's why I think it's important that uh, he has the right advisement um, to be able to help him, help whoever it is, help them along. Uh, I know the ball, you know, uh, kid had his dad there. And so his dad, very knowledgeable, um, and he was able to make that that jump because his dad was able to execute all of his, you know, uh, all the things that he wanted to do, whether it was his deal on his team, uh, sponsors. And so that's very beneficial. Um, If you have someone that you can trust to oversee or be your advisor. um, And that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm not for it. I'm saying that I think, uh, especially kids that are in college, um, it could, you know, being being a kid in college um, at at one time, I would have loved to have been able to uh, take advantage of my name and likeness because I had a hot name, and there are a lot of people buying, um, you know, jerseys, seventeen jerseys, and I was also, you know, featured on like a um, FSU uh, pay pay card um, at one time, and mm-hmm. so there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, for that, um, that I would have loved to to have. But the thing that um, I would suggest is I would try to run everything through the university so that I can have safeguard um, on, you know, the money, one, and two, not becoming overwhelmed. Because if you're a hot name, you're going to have a lot of people coming at you with deals. And now... You're having to navigate school. You have to navigate trying to oversee your team and trying to, you know, when trying to uh, be a part of a football team, doing your part there. And and it can become a big business just like in the pros. But in the pros, you have so much time. You don't have to go to school. You have all your time to do your work, do community service. And as a kid, you know, there's a, that's a lot you have to navigate through, but it's, it could also be a great learning ground for some of those guys as well as they continue to pursue not just, you know, professional sports, but the next career, whatever that next career may be. Definitely, definitely. So good answer. I, I, uh, like I said, I'm just trying to move into the Knicks here um, because you, you spent a good 10 years there with New York. Uh, you played under uh, Pat Riley. You played under uh, – uh, uh, Jeff Van Gundy, who we just recently had on the podcast, um, you, you've played against some greats in that, that 90s era as well. Uh, what is one of your, your fondest memories of playing with the Knicks? Um, well, I would say, you know, making it into the NBA finals was uh, one of the finer moments 
uh, because we were AC that year. Um, and, you know, it was a lockout year. And so we had some challenges. We had some new players, Latrell Sprewell, Marcus Canby, Kirk uh, Thomas. And we were all trying to, you know, navigate our way through uh, yeah. a, a shortened season. Um, and so uh, it was it was challenging because we had some injuries as well um, during, the, during the regular season because we were playing like three games back to back, you know, three games in a row at one point. Uh, just to try to get 50 games in, I do believe. And so it was really, really tough on the body. Um, and for us being new, we had to learn how to gel. And new players come from different systems. And coming into Coach Van Gundy's system was, a you know, a bit of a challenge. Right. Um, and him trying to learn them. And, and so it took us some time. But we uh, went on a um, six-game winning streak heading into the playoffs. And so we, we, we caught fire at the end. Um, and once we caught fire, we were able to ride that momentum going into the playoffs. And, you know, we were able to upset Miami, who's the number one seed. Um, and during that time, it was a five-game playoffs um, series, which always favors both teams. So um, it gives you an opportunity, you know, in five games, there, there, there were not as many – eight versus one upsets, but there were a couple. Um, in this day and age, you won't ever probably see a one versus eight upset because in seven games, at some point, your talent's going to win out um, and you have more depth because you're one seed. But for us, we had just as much talent as Miami. And in a five-game series, um, and even if it was seven, we, we still probably could have won the series because we had great talent. Um, as well, but we were able to win that that series and that kind of catapulted us into you know going on and playing um, in the NBA Finals. But we knew it was going to be tough playing the NBA Finals against San Antonio because we had lost Patrick mm -hmm. to a calf injury, um, and then we had lost Larry in like Game Three or Four. Um, in the Indiana series, you know, he had a, a, a sprained knee ligament. And so um, so he was hobbling, trying to play, but he ended up not being able to play in the finals. And so that left us shorthanded on depth. And we had two twin towers um, to try to compete against. And Tim Duncan was a handful as a rookie. And <clears throat> David Robinson uh, was a – Another handful, you know, he was seven foot as well and didn't have some really good guards um, that we had to contend with. So their depth and their size just kind of overwhelmed us. And we, were, we just didn't have the depth or the size to be able to compete at the high level. So we were only able to win one game out of five. But that was a great season for us. We had, it, was, it was enjoyable, um, especially when we beat uh, – um, Indiana, I think mm -hmm. it was game six, oh, yeah. game six, game six or seven. Uh, I think we beat Indiana and just the, the garden, the way they uh, appreciated the way we, we competed. Um, and they, they kind of, they stayed after the game um, and clapped, the, clapped and stand ovation. And so that moment was a great moment that, as I always talk about, sometimes you have to enjoy the moment because you may not ever get back there again. And so that was an enjoyable moment. That's what's up. And um, we talked, like, like, like Chris mentioned earlier, we had uh, Jeff Van Gundy on the episode about, on the podcast about two episodes ago. Um, and he, he mentioned something about you. He said, and I also seen this, you and Anquan talk about this on your live as well. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're a Christian, you're a religious man. And um, he was like, but he he was a killer. He said he'll pray for you, you know, before and after the game, but during the game, he'll cut your throat out. <laughs> and um, with, with that attitude, uh, I'm I'm usually the guy that brings up the scuffles. And you 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 were involved in a scuffle <laughs> against that uh, Miami Heat team 
but with the likes of a guy named PJ Brown. Could you? Uh, uh, Chris? Oh, nice. Oh, we got we got Christmas <laughs> fighting and stuff. <laughs> but uh, what what do you remember about that that uh, altercation between you and PJ Brown? Um, of course, it was a, a heated game. Uh, all of our games against Miami were uh, heated because the two teams were very, very much alike in a lot of ways. The coaches were alike. The styles were alike. The mindset was alike. And so it's just like a marriage. You know, when you have two people who are alike, you have a lot of uh, altercations, um, a lot of discussions because you're alike. Um, and, and so uh, that was us. You know, we, we had a lot of competitive uh, spirits, competitive moments, and that was one of them. Um, there was something that went on before that, before our altercation. Um, I think a couple of guys may have gotten injected peacefully <laughs> um, uh, after their altercation. Uh, but then, you know, I went to box out PJ Brown, who, you know, I'm six, whatever, and he's <laughs> 6'11", and so I ended up boxing him out in his legs, take away his legs so he couldn't jump. And uh, he, he took a fence to it and like flipped me uh, into the front row. And, and then we had this whole big, you know, altercation, which it wasn't peaceful. Uh, we had, we had every, you know, guys come from the bench and, you know, and the moment wasn't to a point where it became a melee. Um, with fans and also players. And so, you know, there were a couple of guys just trying to make sure that they took care and protected uh, their own. And it was one of the reasons, you know, the reason why they have to stay on the bench um, rule in the NBA now is because of us um, in a lot of ways. Uh, well, that's when it started. There were a lot of fights before us, but that's when it started. They had the rule where you can't get on the floor um, can't put your toe on the floor if you're on the bench um, and, and those types of things. Uh, but that happened. And, you know, the good thing about it is, you know, I learned from it. And we ended up losing that series because we were, I think we were up 3-1. Um, and we ended up losing that series because the last – that game, uh, I think the last two games, uh, we we had – multiple guys out at different times. I mean, we, right. we had guys, um, what you call it, um, suspended. Right. We had a couple of guys su suspended multiple games. Mm -hmm. um, and so we weren't able to get back on track and they ended up winning the series. But, you know, the thing that I admired most was, um, you know, PJ and I, of course, we're good friends um, and, you know, he support he's supported my football program at one point. And if I pick up the phone today and call him, you know, we can laugh about it. And, you know, that's kind of what it's about. Um, because I mean, you are who you are, you know, off the court, on the court, you competitor, and those things do happen. Um, but the thing is, is are you that way all the time? And that wasn't me. Um, all the time. I was a competitor, yes. I, I competed at a high level. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to kill someone, but I'm going to go out and compete. <laughs> uh, do, do as much as I can, you know, a little bit above the, 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 uh, the line, a little bit below the line, uh, depending upon if you get caught. But that's uh, neither here nor there, but I do compete at a high level and, and want to win, you know. That's what most people uh, who are competitive, you know, they're going to compete. And, and because if they can do whatever they can do to get, gain an advantage, um, especially during that time, you know, it was more mind trying to get into guys' minds by playing physical and, you know, doing, you know, little things, grabbing, holding, you know, whatever it was, you trying to trying to gain an advantage. And, um, and so – that's what we did to, to try to try to win. That was just part of the tactics. And also in that live, um, I'm I'm stealing your whole live and and whatnot. But uh, like being a Christian, uh, you asked Anquan, was it awkward uh, starting a a Bible study group in the locker room? Um, 
but you didn't get to really tell your story on that. And I just wanted to know, you know, how did that start with you uh, and, and your teammates? Um, it really started, um, of course, I was a Christian um, going, going into the NBA. Uh, but there was, a, there was a thing that I struggled with, and it was, and it was pornography. And when we were on the road, um, I, we would get in late, and one of the things I would do was go turn on television. And as we know, it was pay-per-view, and it was easy access. You're in a room by yourself. And that was something that I struggled with at that time. And, of course, being a Christian, um, I had a couple of brothers from the Church of Christ in New York uh, challenge me on my faith. And when they challenged me on my faith, um, I had to make a decision. And it's just like, you know, a coach. You know, you, they challenge you in a certain area. You have to make a decision on whether you're going to put the time and effort in to better yourself. And that's what they did. And once I started to dig into the scriptures more um, and make sure that my faith was, you know, what I said it was before, um, I decided to reach out to um, Reggie White, the late Reggie White. Huh. Who, of course, as we know, he's the minister of defense, but he's also a minister, uh, a preacher as well. And reached out to him, and he got us involved in calls, which was Christian Athletes Unite for, for Spiritual Empowerment. And that gave an opportunity to uh, get into a network of uh, NFL, NBA uh, players. And But what it did was he challenged me um, to start a Bible study. Um, and I was like, well, I don't know how to lead a Bible study because I didn't really know scriptures that well and he was like just get a book that may be able to guide you and so we got um a we got a curriculum um, of a book um the man one of the man was the man god the man god uses uh by the huckabee brothers i mean huckabee family um, and we started going through that uh, on the road and so as we all know if you have a problem with something uh, and you're trying to get rid of that problem uh, or fix it, you can't uh, try to get rid of it and not replace it with something. And so um, instead of me going to my room, I had to uh, discipline myself. No, I can discipline myself is through the scriptures uh, to be able to hold me uh, accountable uh, to that, but also I had to have some brothers to be able to help me along the way. And so starting the Bible study kind of helped develop um, my relationship with those guys so that I could be accountable for my actions. And it also gave me something to do when I was on the road. Um, and, and so that's kind of how we got started um, with our Bible study on the road. Um, and of course, when we were in town, we had church and those types of things. I also had friends that we were, you know, having Bible study with over their house. Um, as well, but on the road was where I struggled, and I wanted to make sure that I had uh, some safeguards, uh, some count, some accountability to be able to overcome, you know, the, the issue I had with pornography. And so, you know, that's that's kind of that's the way it really started uh, with you know, Reggie sharing with us, sharing with me, you know, get a get a uh, curriculum to start the Bible study, and then we went through, you know, throughout my my tenure. Uh, we went through a few few uh, curriculums, uh, which definitely helped us, you know, along the way. And it helped strengthen our our, our brothers. You know, Alan Houston was a good brother um, that developed and grew his relationship to where he is today. Um, and of course, Mark Jackson was there. Had Kirk Kirk um, Thomas come through. Um, we had some other. You know, guys, Terry Cummins was there, Buck Williams, when uh, he was there, mm -hmm. um, Chris Dudley. And so we had quite a few guys come through. Uh, Scotty Brooks was another guy that used to join our uh, Bible studies. And so, you know, it was good for those guys as well. Uh, once they got to the team and they saw that we were doing this on the road, uh, they were very appreciative because most of those guys were Christians. Nice, nice. <clears throat> I'm gonna, you know, I'm actually going to take you 
away from, from sports for a second because I'm compelled to ask your opinion on, on the current events right now. Uh, just listen to you speak. I'm just interested in hearing uh, the current events and the, the everything right now as far as George Floyd, um, just where we are as a nation um, with racism and, and, and things like that. Just, again, as a Christian man, um, our beliefs, what, what do you think, uh, how do you think we move forward right now and uh, the next step of things? Uh, well, you know, I, George Floyd, of course, has sparked what we've been going through for quite some time um, again. And, you know, Colin Kaepernick, I, I know I talked with Anquan yesterday about Colin Kaepernick and what, he's, what he was kneeling for. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't disrespecting the wasn't his motive wasn't disrespecting the flag. It was to make a statement um, of social injustice, mm -hmm. and so um, that is you know something that I think you know all all of us who are of color have experienced at some point in time. Um, at, at some point in time, we've experienced it in some form of fashion, whether we want to agree. Um, that it happened or not, but it does happen. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm you know, appreciative of is, you know, all the people that are willing to step up um, and, you know, want to try to make change or have change happen. And just like Martin Luther King, when he was marching, he needed, you know, everyone's voice, you know, not just the black, black voice um, or the brown voice, um, but he needed the, the white voice as well, um, and everyone working together um, to be unified. And so one of the things I do know that won't ever be eradicated is evil. Um, evil is, all, is, all, is always going to be present. Um, it happened in the Garden of Eden, um, and that's one of the things that we have a choice. And so evil will always be uh, prevalent, but I believe that God is bigger. Uh, than all those things. And my prayer is that we can have um, hearts that are evil be able to uh, change uh, for, the, for the betterment of humanity uh, and not protecting certain people. Um, but and, and for doing wrong, I'll just say that. <laughs> certain people for doing wrong. Um, and, and I think that's where the injustice comes in when you see... Um, some getting getting through the loophole yeah. that that may be in the system that may be a system a favorite, um, and then you see some that may not be a system favorite. You know, getting death penalty, getting more time for similar crimes, yeah. um, and so I just think it's important that you know we get people vote people in that uh, have an understanding of just being fair. Of course, life is not going to be fair all the time, but we just want to see it happening <laughs> sometimes for the good, you know, for the majority of the time. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, having the right mindset in offices, people who are making laws, um, and, you know, yes, there, there are going to be protections, but for people, but when they step over, overstep their bounds, they can't be above the law um, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if someone kills someone, they shouldn't be above the law. Um, and they should get the same, you know, they should go through the process just as if a black person killed a white person um, or, you know, that, that direction. And as we've seen, uh, when that does happen, it seems like justice is served and you get a, a high conviction um, and you're in prison longer um, but when it's the other way around it just seems like and it more than likely happens this way Yeah, justice may be served but the conviction is not higher. They may get you know two years and two years in prison and Back on ten the years street. of probation or five, <laughs> years, five years of probation and mm -hmm. with the same crime yeah. And so that's where the injustice comes in and, and putting people in. And it's not just black people that you want to vote in office. It's people who have a heart 
to want to do the right things. And also our, our law, our lawmakers, you know, putting the right people in is going to fight for, you know, social, social um, equality um, and putting laws in place that is not just about favoring one system. I mean, one, one group of people. Mm, definitely. Definitely. And you mentioned earlier, you was like, we didn't, we need more than just, you know, the black, the black voices to speak out and stuff. Uh, we need, we need the white voices and uh, everybody really. But yes. um, we had uh, the other day, uh, I'm sure you're aware, like the whole world, uh, Drew Brees uh, made the comments that he made about um, when asked about players kneeling, you know, for the national anthem. Um, just wanted to get your opinion on that um and how he's been getting you know a lot of backlash from right. everybody <laughs> right, right. So, yeah so um, just want to get your take on that yeah the thing that i'm, I'm kind of torn because he was speaking from his experience yes uh, he was speaking from what he thought and of course it wasn't what i would say and what i would think um, and I think that's something that we're having to work through as well to hear everyone's voice, whether we agree or disagree. Um, that's, that's not the, the issue. Um, and yes, he missed the point on why he was kneeling. Um, but that was his, 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 his point. I mean, that was his thought process. And, and it's very similar to Yes, yeah, so sometimes we do miss the, miss the mark on why certain things happen, but that's the way I see it. Um, and yes, you know, he went back and retracted, and that's what humility looks like. Um, and that's what I wish some of our uh, leaders would do. Um, even though in his mind he is right, but for him to go and say, you know, this is – you know, what I said was, you know, probably wasn't hitting the mark on why it all happened, but that's, that was his thought process. And I've been in this situation before as well, where, you know, I was um, having to deal with a Jewish issue uh, yeah. where someone wrote, wrote something that I said, uh, it took a quote out of me saying, uh, talking about the Jewish, um, the blood of Jesus being on their hands and those type of things. Right. And, and I went through that whole, whole um, issue and I had to learn, you know, I learned from it because um, that wasn't what I said. And it was, a, it was taken out of context, but I had to go through that time and I had to hold myself because I knew what I said and what I meant. And it was, you know, what I thought was right and accurate, but it divided a whole whole, you know, a whole, whole group of people. Um, and, and so I had to go and learn about the Jewish culture, which I did and was great. Um, and I've had, you know, had instances where, you know, they were, I got booed at home in New York because that's a, um, you know, big town uh, with Jewish people in it. And then while I was on the road one game um, in Dallas, um, there's a young man I, of course, I didn't know him, but we were getting prepared and ready for uh, the second half. And so I was shooting the layups um, and doing, doing those necessary things. And every time I would circle back around in front of him, he was calling me out of my name. And I didn't know the guy. And, you know, I kept going until the last, like, minute or so. And we were getting ready to go in and, and take, uh, bring it in for, you know, the third, get it in for the third quarter. And so I just politely walked over to the guy and, and uh, introduced myself because apparently he didn't know my name uh, because he was calling me out of my name. And so I just politely went over and introduced myself and, and let him know I'm Charlie Ward and I just want to make sure you understand and know I have no, no ill feelings towards you or your, your race. And... Um, don't always believe what you read. And I just politely walked off and I, I extended my hand to shake his hand. 
and I'm not sure. I don't think he did um, shake my hand. Or he may have. But the thing I, I want to say is we got to we have to agree to disagree and let people share their thoughts and feelings, even though they may have missed the mark on why something you know happened. Um, and yes, I understand, but that didn't make him not a very good teammate. Um, that didn't make him not a very good person, which I saw a lot of people trying to say he's not a good person, he's not a good teammate because he missed the mark on that. And I think we some, I mean, I'm included, I think we all included, we missed the mark on some things. And so we got to appreciate that he went back and said, I missed the mark. Um, and people saying, well, the, the apology was half, half hearted. And, and uh, well, whether it was half hearted, it happened. Because sometimes people don't, don't do it at all. And so I think we got to stop looking at when people do things, how, how they're doing it. And yes, if it's half hearted, God's going to bring that up at some point in time in his, in his life and expose him for it if it was half hearted. I have to, real quick, I just got to agree with you. I, I felt the same exact way. Uh, I felt that uh, as, a, as a black community, uh, we have to be careful when people are, are you know, they make mistakes or are, are not understanding of where our position is, um, that we don't just cancel or just throw them away, uh, especially when you take the effort to say, okay, listen, I messed up. I, I didn't understand your point of view. Um, so here I am. I spoke to my teammates, my friends, you know, that was one of the things that was important to me. I saw in his apology that he reached out and spoke to people first and then came back to the table and said, listen, this is where I'm wrong at. Um, so to me, that was sincere. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's, I thought that's what we were looking for was, was understanding somebody for people to say, listen, I don't get it, but I'm willing to get it. So, um, yeah, I, you, I, I think, uh, he apologized. Uh, let's move forward. It's a growing, it's a growing moment. Right. Uh, and, and not a throwing away kind of moment. So I definitely appreciate right. you on that one. Yeah. yeah, no, and I'm like, you know, it was, it, he really just dropped the ball and like when everything he said was right at the beginning. Those first, I don't know, eight or 10 words where he, you know, he said, uh, you know, he wouldn't accept anybody, you know, disrespecting the flag. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I think his apology was sincere as well. Um, but, you know, like we have we have to be it's important for us to be like you said earlier, Chris, it's important for us to be understanding that we go have differences. And, you know, even if he you know, he apologized, he may still not feel well. He probably don't. He probably don't feel right. what we feel right. and he probably never will. And right. we have we have to accept that and still be able to move forward and continue, continue to grow as a nation, because it's not, you know, uh, like. We, we we have coworkers, we have teammates who, you know, we're we're together on the field or on the court or at work. But when we leave, you know, we may be good friends at work, but when we leave, we right. go to our families and you know our right. you know our regular life. So it's you know when somebody, it, it's different if it's like a family member do, you know do that to you or whatever. It's a little it'll hit you a little harder. But I think um, it, it it was definitely unfortunate. Uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully good comes out of it. I've seen a bunch of different opinions about that and uh, right. hope, hope some good come out of it. Well, I, um, I do believe with him being a Christian, um, it's probably eating at him um, yeah. that he uh, missed the mark um, because he just, uh, he spoke what he truly feels um, about the kneeling and that's his personal opinion. Uh, but this is where I hope we can get to as a nation is, yes, we may miss the mark on what other people may feel um, about a certain situation, but it should have, you should have some type of conviction that you missed the mark. Um, and I think a lot of times in our nation, those that feel like they're doing what's best for um, as, Miles McPherson, you may know Miles, he has a book called A Third Option. And he talks about how the world is centered around a built for right-handed people. And, you know, if you're left-handed, you're, 
you're a small uh, minority in our country. And so everything you have to navigate your way through around to be left-handed. And so everything's built for a right-hander. And it's very similar, you know, to our country. Everything's built for the people who, you know, really run the country, which is, you know, white American uh, males. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but we got to get to a point where, just like Drew, it has to be eating at you because you missed the mark. You didn't get it right. Yeah. Um, and we go back to Colin Kaepernick, and we talked about this yesterday, you know, the owners. It should be eating at them that they missed the mark on giving Colin Kaepernick another opportunity because of the stance that he took. And, but no one has felt convicted enough to be able to give him an opportunity because you can't tell me he's not one of the best 32 quarterbacks in the NFL, even at this day and time. Yes. Being out for three years or however long he's been out. And so hopefully we can get to a point where we can say, I was wrong. And that's the thing that I don't think, you know, our country's gotten to. Uh, president. But, <coughs> Excuse me. Say again? I said the president. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> uh, you said it, I didn't. Uh, but, well. you know, it's just, it's just we got to get to a point where we say, yes, I was wrong in this, on this, in this area. And it should be eating at you that you can't, you can't sleep at night because you're like, I just, I didn't get it. I missed the, I missed the mark. Um, and even though I was sharing, or I know what is right. This is not what the system says is right. And so now you're in that conflict. That's where the conflict should come. I know what's right and the system says it's not right. So now I have this conflict. I don't think we're at that point yet. Until we get to that point is when we will start to see change. Right. I, uh, I don't know if you saw the, the video that a lot of the NFL superstars put out last night um, in which they called for the NFL to, uh, to, to give them the freedom to protest peacefully. They called for the NFL to, uh, to say that Black Lives Matter. And they called for the NFL to, uh, to do more than just uh, words. Um, of course, the NFL is a lot less of uh, players – player driven as, as the NBA, uh, the NBA players, they have a lot more power, a lot more freedom. Um, uh, do you think, or do you see something like that happening where the NFL, because this is something, speaking on Kaepernick, this is something that I feel like I'm waiting for. I'm saying, you know, at this point, do we have a coach, a GM, a uh, owner, somebody come out and say, listen, we got it wrong. We got it wrong on Kaepernick's front. Um, do, do you see that possibly happening, even with the players coming out and demanding that right now? Um, I'm, I, if I had to pray and hope, I hope someone would. Just, it doesn't take but one. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I, and it's one rebel coach to say, you know, I want him on my team because he can help us win football games. Um, and we'll have to deal with, you know, whatever comes with that scrutiny. Um, and so it's going to follow him. And he has to, to understand and know that um, if he does get another opportunity, that he can't continue, you know, say the fight or the protest. Yeah. Um, he's made his point. One has been well taken. And now it's time for him to kind of move on and do things behind the scenes or continue what he's doing today. Um, and I think, um, you know, the NFL – Definitely the NBA, they, when this, all this kneeling stuff came out, they became unified that no one was going to do it. And, you know, they would have other forms to be able to do it. Um, and so, you know, it was a unified front. Um, even though they wanted to, you know, I'm sure there are players that wanted to kneel during the national anthem, um, but they found a way to become a unified front um, without, any of the, the kneeling doing the national anthem. Um, and so I think it's, uh, I asked my man Troy Vincent uh, the other day when I was, you know, interviewing and of course he didn't tell me, uh, which, you know, was the right answer because he wanted the right, you know, things to come out the right way. 
Um, but I do believe they have a plan of action um, uh, it, with more protests, kneeling, those types of things. I think that's still been happening. Uh, but it's time for us to move forward. As uh, Anquan talked about yesterday, uh, we made that statement that kneeling, social injustice, yes, we understand that part, but what's next? Right. The next part is now. to to go out and vote, start, you know, pushing voters to the um, vote you know, booths and getting the right people in and stop voting party lines, you know, vote people because of, you know, what they believe in um, and doing your homework in that area. And so um, I do believe that they have, they, the NFL, NBA can have an active voice in uh, helping people understand, you know, what is going on because I think this has gotten the attention of many um, to become unified in some form or fashion. And yes, we need change to happen, but the next change is changing a wave of leaders. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, um, you know, we're not, we, we ain't gonna hold you up too much longer, but I, I did have, uh, I got like two more questions for you. Um, Taking you back to New York, um, I, my brother has has a podcast, and he interviewed uh, Chris Childs, uh, one of your former teammates, uh -huh. um, and he he talked about his relationship currently with the New York Knicks, and I, I just wanted to know um, uh, your story right now. Do you have a good relationship? Do you have a relationship at all with the New York Knicks? And um, you know, what do you think about uh, their their situation they're in? Um, one of the things my mom always taught me was, my mom and dad always taught me were whenever you leave somewhere, leave a bridge, build a bridge, um, never burn a bridge, um, regardless if your experience there was not fruitful, I mean, not, uh, not good, um, never, never burn bridges when you leave. And of course, I haven't had very many bad experiences. I've had a couple um, here and there, but I've never burned bridges. I always built relationships with people because people treated me with respect, um, even though sometimes they didn't, didn't agree with me on certain things. Uh, but I've always you know, left you know, in a, a good fashion. Um, and I'm gonna share this with you. And, you know, the Knicks drafted me. They gave me an opportunity. And I appreciate that. Even though management, the ownership has changed, um, I'm still appreciative of the New York Knicks. So if I call and ask for tickets, you know, I'm able to get them because I have a relationship with them. Um, and if I go to New York, you know, and they have a game, I get an opportunity to go. Um, the biggest thing, of course, there are not many James Dolan fans, um, but I'm one because I built a relationship with him. I'm able to have talks with him about certain things and we can agree to disagree on certain things, but that's the beauty of having a relationship. And he supported all of my, my, uh, my teams uh, with donations. Um, and, you know, that's why, you know, he, yes, he has his faults just like we all have faults. Um, and things he may do or say may not be accurate or right. Um, but when you have a relationship with someone, um, you're able to talk to them and give them insight, whether they agree or disagree on it. But I'm grateful, you know, for his heart to want to see what I am doing and support that. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of, you know, people that don't like him, which, you know, that's their prerogative. Right. But for me, being a New York Nick, and they say new, once a New Yorker, once a Nick, always a Nick, you know, I'm going to always be grateful for, you know, for that organization. And, you know, the reason, one of the reasons they're not successful, haven't been successful lately is, they just haven't had a stability um, in the front office. Um, and so when you have a lot of instability, 
um, in the front office, you're not going to have great success. And the crazy part about it is Mr. Dolan owns the Rangers and the Knicks. And one organization has had great success or greater success than the other one over the past years that he's been the owner. And so I don't know what the difference is, but, right. you know, they're, they're still owned by the same guy. Right, and, right. and so I just think as far as the Knicks are concerned, once they can get the stability in the front office, you know, they'll be a lot, lot better off. And even today, you know, with Leon Rose taking over, um, and Scott Perry, the GM, uh, not sure about his future, you still have that unsettling um, of understanding of where you are as, a, as an organization yeah, because yeah. he didn't have a contract passed, you know, this season. And so, you know, that's – until they can get all the levels lined up, the president, the, uh, the GM, the head coach – uh, all on the same page. That's that's what that's e that's what's going to equal to success, and that's what you see in most of the successful organizations and even programs, college, high school, doesn't matter. Uh, when everyone's lined up with the same vision, um, and of course you're going to you have the same vision, you're going to have great success in supporting one another. Awesome. I uh, I, I agree with you. I actually had a talk with Mark a couple weeks ago. Um, re re regarding the Knicks, I said the same thing. I feel like with Leon coming in, I feel like um, changing of the guard somewhat. Um, and I feel like they're in place right now to line everything up to start heading towards championships. Um, and with that on my mind, my last question to you is, the NBA is coming back to the wonderful world of Disney. Who do you see winning the championship? I mean, at this point, I mean, it can be anyone, you know, because everyone's been off, been off um, the same amount of time. Of course, there were, uh, I know they just opened up facilities here recently uh -huh. within the past, uh, you know, few weeks, a month or so. And so, I mean, it, whoever's in the playoffs at this time, anyone can, because because there's not going to be, I don't know how they're going to do, you know, if they're just doing the playoffs, uh, everyone's starting at the same same point. Where, you know, there, there aren't very many games to, to continue, uh, continue where you left off. Uh, we know the favorites um, of the teams that were playing well uh, up until the, the time, you know, it was cut. Right. Uh, the season was suspended. Um, and so, I mean, you're still going to have your favorites, you know, the Lakers, you know, Milwaukee in the East. Uh, you got the Clippers. Um, you know, I heard that James Harden lost weight. And so, you know, <laughs> in the two months, they off. You know, I don't know how he's going to come back. He may be better, he may not. Um, and so there's a lot of factors that, it's kind of a wait and see, but it's very similar to the time that we made it to the finals. Yeah. Uh, because there's going to be probably, I don't know if there'll be seven games, you know, each each round um, to be able to get a, get a, get get the uh, the playoffs in. But it can go either way. Um, at this point, I think anyone has a chance, and I think that's the part that may make it uh, fun. Mm -hmm. you know, that every team will have an opportunity to at least, you know, hold a crown, even though it's a um, asterisk uh, season, asterisk mark by by the season. But um, you can't say that to the team that may have been the AC, um, you know, going into the suspended season, and they come, you know, get to the finals. You know, they're like, who cares? You know, we're right, right. we're. Um, we're in the mix just like everyone else. Um, and so I just think it's, it's any, anyone can win the championship this year. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll, yes. I'll give it to you, Mark, but I actually believe an eighth seed is going to be the one seed this year in the East. Go ahead, Mark. Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, that's, that's possible. Yeah, and so we're going we to have a repeat of the New York Knicks. <laughs> well, <laughs> well my, my last question for you is uh, – 
you know, since you're a dual sport guy, even though I, I've, I've read somewhere you play a little tennis too. I play. <laughs> but um, b- being that you play basketball, football, um, I want to know who do you think is the greatest quarterback of all time and who do you think is the greatest NBA player of all time? Um, the greatest quarterback? Yeah. Of all time? Of all time. Um, I would, I mean, I'm, I was a huge fan of his when it comes to just being a great leader. Um, one of my heroes uh, would be, you know, he did, he was consistent um, in the way he went about his business. You're looking at, I'm talking about Joe Montana. I know people thought about it, they're talking about <laughs> Brady. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a Joe Montana fan. Of course, Brady was one of the best as well. And, I mean, you know, you, you got a big list of 10, you know, quarterbacks uh, when it comes to greatest of all time. But, I'm, like I said, I was a Joe Montana fan, and, you know, he won championships um, as well. Um, so, if that was the case, then you know, I, I would choose Joe, Joe Montana mm-hmm. as a quarterback because he's, he's more like me, I guess. Um, in some form of fashion. Uh, Basketball-wise, I mean, you know, you got your debates for Michael and LeBron and Kobe. Um, If you want to go back to Wilt Chamberlain, Oscar Robinson, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, um, Isaiah Thomas, you name it. It's just a matter of who you want to choose, what area you come from. Um, I know for me, when it comes to era, I was in the era of Michael Jordan. And so I got the beginning stages of Kobe and uh, LeBron. I didn't play against um, Larry Bird um, or Magic. I don't think I played against Magic. If I had to choose during my era, um, since that's the time that I played, I would say uh, Michael Jordan. Okay, okay. That was a good, yeah, good one. I, I, I was going to try to bait you into saying something crazy on here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I mean, you know, like I said, it's other people, of course, will will have to come with all they, – they would come with all their stats and, and, and on why LeBron is better and why Kobe is better. And my whole gist is, I, I live next to a, a cow pasture. And when I arrive by the cow pasture, there's not one cow in the cow pasture. There are many cows in a cow pasture. There's a big, <laughs> a big pasture out there. And so when we start talking about goats, we can do the same thing. We can put a lot of people in that goat pasture. And so when it comes to the naming one person, we can name our one and let's throw a pasture. And so when we pass by, we have a big goat factory out there with all the people that we have chosen to be the number one goat uh, in whatever sport it is. And so I just, you know, people get in these big heavy debates on who's what and coming up with all these stats. I'm like that, like the cow pasture. Let's put them all in that pasture and say they're all goats and let them, you know, enjoy one another's, you know, company. Hey, you, hey I, I haven't heard it put like that ever, but that, that was great. I like that, man. I, oh, yeah. Hey, oh, <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> hey and, um, so, hey, once again, we want to thank you for joining us. Um, if you want to um, – Shout out your Instagram and Twitter handle, social medias, or any foundations you got going on. Um, you can let the let the listeners know. Uh well, all my most of my handles are at Charlie Ward official. Um, and of course, you can. I have a foundation 
um, called the Charlie Ward Family Foundation. Um, and so if you want to Google, um, any of, you know, what we're doing, you can do that. Uh, CharlieWard.org is where if you want to purchase my book, The Athlete, um, if you purchase it off of, the, off of, my, off of my website, um, I'll sign it and we'll send it back. I'm signed copy on a picture, however you want to do it. You can go to charlieward.org to get those uh, items. Um, but I appreciate you guys having me on a minute to six. And y'all have a great uh, weekend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, once again, y'all, it's your boy Mark Haynes, MH the Champ, along with my co host, Chris Perry at Chris Perry, Chris. Perry. Awesome. And this is a minute till six, and we out. Peace.